Oh, okay. hey, so it's snow, man. Man. What's that? <laughs> you just come out of snow like that, dude. You scare me. <laughs> <laughs> Good day and welcome to the fifth edition of the Malagash Bible Camp podcast. I'm your host, Andy Leeper, and today I am joined with Mitch Horan. We'll get into uh, all about what's going on with Mitch here in a moment, but I do want to remind you that Malagash Bible Camp exists to bring glory to God by presenting the gospel of Jesus Christ in a summer and winter camping ministry. And I also, as usual, want to shout out to Alex Stephen, who so graciously allows us to use his studio. You can find Alex um, with the band Life Support Music on Instagram, and also check him out in his daytime at Apartment 3 Espresso Bar in Lower Sackville. And also shout out to Nathan Jollymore, who's graciously uh, does all of our video editing. So, how are you, Mitch? How are you doing? Good, dude. It's good to see you, man. I'm super... I wish I could be in that picture that is behind you, man, <laughs> and just hanging out it, with a bunch of people drinking a hot cup of coffee in the lounge. Yeah, yeah. You know, um, it's not... There's not actually snow right here. This is, for those... This is a virtual background. I'm not actually at Malagash. We've had five days in a row here of almost 15 degrees Celsius weather in Ooh. March. So all the snow is gone. It's actually beautiful out, but uh, you're absolutely right. I love Malagash in the winter just as much I love Malagash in the summer. Totally, man. Totally. Yeah. I think, Mitch, the last time I saw you, I think it was at Malagash. I think you're right, dude. I think I was the speaker at one of the junior teens. Uh, was this six years ago, I think, was the last time I saw you? Yeah, that would be that would be about right, man. That was the summer I served on staff. Would have been six years ago, or or I might have actually been directing that week with okay. Carmen Swain, maybe. Okay, probably wasn't that week. I was the speaker one week, and it was the week we had all the G Rock kids up there. Okay, um, right on. And I think you were on staff that summer, so I, yeah. I think that's the last time I saw you. But you look you look fitter when I right now than when last I saw you. So it looks like you've been. Uh, Marriage has marriage has done me well, man. She makes oh, me that's good. <laughs> <laughs> that's good. That's good. When did you get married? I got married four years ago, dude, to a lovely Mexican woman named Jackie. Okay, yeah. nice, nice. So we'll get into Mexico in a minute. But for our audience who doesn't quite know who you are, tell me a little bit about yourself and and uh, how how you were connected to Malagash and that sort of thing. Sweet man. So my name's Mitch Foran, as you said. Um, actually came to Malagash for the first time in 2010. I was there as a camper in my first week of senior teens. I had never been to a Christian, I had never been in a Christian environment before. I had never, had never gone to church, uh, Christian church. Um, and I just was completely dumbfounded at the fact that people could actually love Jesus. Right. And I found a community that loved Jesus and from Malagash, I actually got connected with Seaside Community Baptist Church. Mm -hmm. A bunch of the guys from there had a high school group at my high school. And so they were all in. I got involved kind of more than anything from social pressure. But, man, Jesus <laughs> used Malagash in an amazing way. I was there as a camper in, in 2010, 2011, 2012, and 2013 in senior teens. I was on staff in 2014. And so, yeah, yeah. dude, uh, I Let was only there back. for one year. Yeah. Let me jump back for a minute. So 2010, what grade were you in 2010 or how old were you? I was just going into grade tw grade 10. Grade 10. Okay. And you said, excuse me, you had no background in anything Christian at that time. No, I grew up in the Catholic church, but more of like anything than just going on Sundays because my mom made me. <laughs> it was more than yeah. anything. Yeah. You're religion. like me. I grew up in the Catholic church. And uh, went there until I was in grade five or so. And I won't get into my story tonight, but eventually 
you know, got connected to another church and started to go to Malagash too. So it was a big, uh, uh, intricate part of my walk as well. So you're, you're going into grade 10, you've just started high school and does a friend invite you to Malagash? Yeah. So I actually had two friends who had gone to Malagash for a couple years before that. And they, they tricked me, man. Who's, who's <laughs> like, that? His name's Mitchell Travis and Nick Graham. Two okay. friends of mine, never served on staff, never volunteered, just just two guys who went to Malagash their whole childhood. And, you know, they told me about all these awesome games and all this great stuff that happens. They never told me about church. You know, right. I was like, what the heck? Where did I end up? You know, <laughs> <laughs> and just got radically encountered with God and found a lot of great people that really modeled um, who Jesus is. And I think that's what made me really trust the ministry of Malagash was the great staff volunteers mm. and campers that modeled who jesus was mm. yeah. so do you remember who the speaker or director was that summer uh speaker i was trying to think about this last night as i was going to bed i was like he's gonna ask me this who who was my first speaker i'm pretty sure it was either jeremy marsh or josh jockstetter okay okay i know both and of them well the director would have been jeff frizzle i think okay. with kelty, kelty davidson Okay, very cool. Very cool. And was it the first summer in 2010 that you had an encounter with Jesus? Or was that just a stepping stone to the next summer to the next summer? That was definitely a stepping stone. I would say my first real encounter with Jesus was uh, at Malagash in 2013. No, 20, 2012. Okay. Um, I just, yeah, that was like a real deep encounter that marked my life. I would say except G- I accepted Jesus. August 22nd, 2012 at 2.42 in the morning in tears in my cabin with Keith Marble. Oh, that is awesome. Yeah. That is awesome. My birthday is August 21st. So I will remember that day. Your spiritual birthday was the day after. So 2.42 a.m. in the middle of the night, you remember the day, the time. Yep. Tell me about that. So we were doing a cabin Devo that Keith said was going to take 30 minutes. Three and a half hours later, we're going to bed. And just God showed up in that place, man. God showed up in that place. And I can remember it so well. And just like he, we did a Devo called Solarium where there's 50 pictures that you put on the ground. Mm-hmm. And there's six questions that make you reflect on your life and where you want to go. And it was just realizing my life has no sense or purpose. I want God. Now, I remember mm. there's a little picture with a bird in the palm of someone's hand. And I just remember, that's what I want. I want that love. I want that security. I want that affirmation. And I just remember going to my bed, and this was my prayer. Like, God, I'll go anywhere. I'll do anything. I'll follow you unto death. But I just want you. Wow. Wow. And I remember I looked at the clock because I was like, I'm going to want to remember this. <laughs> and so I was like, it's 2.42 in the morning, August 22nd, 2012. That's the date. I'm never going to forget it. That's yeah. awesome. So was it just you and Keith or were all the other cabin? cabin uh... Yeah, all the other guys were there. Derek Thorne would have been there with me, if I'm not mistaken. He would okay. have been there too. Um, Keith was the one who walked with me in my first year following Jesus so graciously, so kindly. We would Skype, you know, at 11 o'clock at night. He was mm-hmm. out in Bible college and just once a week would check in, pray for me, you know, discipled me. I am the man who I am because of the staff of Malagash, you know, Forsyth, Pelham, uh, Matt Bustin, Keith Marble, all of those guys invested their lives into mine. And I'm so thankful for each one of them. That is awesome. Yeah. That is, that's inspiring as well. Yeah. You know, you never know, even if you're the friend who goes to Malagash for the games and you totally. invite your friend, how that's going to turn out for God's glory Or, you know, what a little card with the bird on it will do. So it's pretty inspiring, you know, the little things that God will allow to impact us, right? Totally, man. It's like, and it's the follow-up as well. I really believe that that's what kept me Mm -hmm. in the path of Christ. It was the staff who were intentional. It was the staff who followed through throughout the year. You know, that's the sacrifice that a lot of people don't see and they don't get paid. You know what I mean? And And that's the things that they do out of the goodness of their heart for their love for God, you know, that for me was huge, man, in my life. Yeah, it's like the, they quote the Great Commission, go into all the world and make disciples. disciples. That's right. Go into all the world and make converts. No. no, go into all the world and make disciples. So 
I, it's amazing that you remember the day and hour and minute. Um, but like I said, our calling as Christians is to make disciples. So good on Keith and Pelham and those to, to, to walk alongside you, right? Yeah, totally, man. Very cool. Very cool. So now you are um, born again. Yes. Uh, you've had a spiritual awakening. You go back home and tell your family. What, what do they say? Oh, that, that's nice. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I had already been going to Seaside for about a year and a half. And so I got more heavily involved. I started leading what we called the God Squad back then at my high school. Okay. Um, yeah. Started evangelizing all of my friends. Yeah. On fire, man. On fire. Yeah. I had a radical encounter with Jesus. I was getting discipled. There's nothing that can stop me, man. And so, um, yeah, I was like, I'm going to go into ministry. I don't know what ministry even is or how it looks. I'm just like, I'm going to become a youth pastor. That's what okay. I'm going to do what Keith's doing and do the same. You know, it's like, why not? And so that's, that was kind of, I went home, decided that my life was changed forever. I know that's not a normal encounter for a lot of people, but I think for me, I've really found a, a good person to walk, a good couple of people to walk with, yeah. a good church that I could uh, really find some real spiritual food from and to live out my encounter, man. So it was yeah, good. absolutely. Was there anyone that was negative towards you or told you to quit or this isn't going to work or you're just one of those Jesus freaks or whatever it was? Totally, man. Of course. Yeah. You know, lots of people would say, you know, what are you, what are you doing, man? Like, why, you know, why this change? Why are you living this way? You know, and that's just, that's an even greater open door to speak. Mm -hmm. And the, mm -hmm. the good thing for me was to be able to process that after with someone. So it wasn't completely discouragement. Yeah. You know, it was that person seeking me out saying, hey, Mitch, you know how to go this week? How's things, how's things going, man? I mean, Yeah. Lots of, lots of people spoke against me joining ministry, spoke against me doing what I'm doing today, but I was faithful and I was bold in taking steps because I had good friends to walk with. Yeah, absolutely. So that was, as you, yeah, I think that was the summer of grade 12. Then yep. the next summer you go back and serve at Malagash? So it was out of grade 12, I served as a volunteer for the first time. Okay. Um, out of grade 12. Out of grade 12? Yeah, out of grade 12, I served for the first time in, in the summer right before. Um, and then I went to my DTS and I came back and that's when I served on staff. So actually, okay. um, 2013, I went, after grade 12, I went back and served as a volunteer before my DTS. And then after my DTS, I came back and served on staff. Okay, so I know what DTS means, but for those of the, us that right, don't, right, tell right. me, what, what does DTS mean? Sorry, yeah, I went to a six-month training program with an organization called Youth with a Mission. Right. It's called the Discipleship Training School. It's divided into two parts. It's got a, a lecture phase, is what we call like a class time where you do worship, intercession. There's lecturers from all over the world that come and give classes. I did mine here in Mexico. And then there was a three-month, what we call outreach for like an evangelistic time. We went out and shared the gospel for three months in the south of Mexico in different cities and uh, with indigenous groups. And it was just like a, a time of us where there was about 15 of us who just went out on like this crazy trip sharing the gospel with people. My sister did a DTS uh, 15 years ago now, and she went to mm -hmm. she went to Seattle for her lectures and then okay. she went to Cambodia for her outreach. Wow. But she saw, she saw God move in very marvelous ways during that time. Mm -hmm. So tell me during that, so you, you, you graduate from grade 12, you go volunteer for a camp, and then you get connected to YWAM. So how did that connection happen? Man, I often wonder, like, how the heck did I find out about YWAM? <laughs> you know? yeah. well, I just remember, you know, I'm in my graduating year. I'm looking at the price of Bible college going, how in the world am I going to pay for this? Yeah. And thinking, you know what, I'd like to do a missions trip for, for an extended period of time. I think I searched up something that had to do with missions on Google, found youth with a mission. And I was like, this sounds like me. Mm -hmm. I found three bases in the world, Orlando, Florida, Tyler, Texas, and Mazatlan, Mexico. I was like, man, that sounds amazing. I'm going to do it. Why not? And did you have any history with uh, the people of Mexico or Spanish or anything like that? 
nothing, man. It was like almost like as if I was blind and just walked into something crazy. And I was okay. like, I don't know, you know, reflecting halfway through my DTS, how in the world did I end up here? Yeah. And it was just the grace and the goodness of God leading me. And I think that's one thing that we have to learn to trust in. You know, we don't, you know, we thought, oh, I'm not going to, you know, this might not be the perfect step for me right now. Or this might not be exactly what everyone else is doing. But, you know, to find really like that, that sense of fulfillment in our lives, mm -hmm. I think we have to be willing to take radical decisions and go against yes. the current and do something that not everyone else is doing. And so that was for me. That's what DTS was for me. That's what the discipleship training school with YWAM was for me. It was that I'm going to just do something crazy because I believe in God and I want to fall in love with him more. And mm -hmm. I believe that this could be an opportunity for me to find that. So I said, Absolutely. oh, I'll come back and study next year or whatever. And that year turned into eight years. And now here we are <laughs> still living in Mexico. <laughs> you did DTS. Then you came back and you served a full-time summer yep. at Malagash on staff there. That was 2014. Yes. That's right. I think that was the summer that I was speaking that week to the junior teens. I think. Right, bro. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, wow. And uh, I remember even the one thing I would remember about you during that week that I was there was just passion. Thank you. Man. You had a lot of passion for Jesus. And I remember in particular, there was one time at the end of the chapel where I was like, you know, God, I don't know how you're leading right now. And I was trying to discern what should I do? What should I do? And I don't know if you remember this, but I said, Mitch, can you come up and pray for us right now? And you came up and you prayed for us in like 10 minutes. You know, you just kept praying and praying and praying and praying. And uh, I felt at the time, okay, God's had his way now. You know what I mean? So you were a bit of a lifesaver for me that one moment. I was like, I don't know exactly where you're leading, but I know Mitch is going to have a word here or a prayer here. If that's uh, Praise yeah. God, dude. That's awesome. Very cool. Very cool. So now you're in Mexico. Yes. And uh, you've been in Mexico for six years. Uh, yeah, so I did my DTS in 2014, and I've been here, ever, uh, 2013, I've been here ever since. Okay, okay, yeah. tell me about that. Yeah, man, so I served in YWAM Mazatlan as what we would call a discipleship training school leader for three years with them, took outreach teams to India, to, to Chile, to the rest of Mexico, got to see lots of young people's lives transformed, uh, did evangelistic outreaches with them, it was an amazing time. Then I served in Mexico City for three years, the biggest city in Latin America, in the Americas, actually. And so it was crazy. We had a base right in the middle of downtown. Um, nuts. We served in prostitution ministries. We did ministry with homeless people. Okay. That was kind of what we did for three years. Um, we also led the discipleship training schools, but working more specifically in those two areas of society. Um, saw lots of people transform people off the streets. You know, get to hear stories from people all the time of just, wow, you know, God did an amazing thing in our lives. And obviously that wasn't every week, you know, going mm -hmm. out and serving. Obviously we saw a lot of horrible things. Lots of people die, lots of people, you know, bad stuff, but like getting to see some fruit was honestly really beautiful. And then Is from there, there's, yeah. Go ahead. And then from there, we actually just moved a year ago up to a city called Ciudad Juarez. Um, Ciudad Juarez is just on the border here of Texas. So we're serving here with them. Mm -hmm. Uh, we help lead a discipleship training school right now. We're doing uh, helping with the children's home here. We have an orphanage on our base. So we have 20 kids who live with us. It's amazing. Um, wow. We're also doing an, a project with an unreached people group here in Mexico that's about six hours away. So we're helping with oral Bible translation for them. Okay. So that. are you currently like where you sleep at night is in the same place where these children sleep? Yeah, so where, where me and my wife live, we live in a separate house all here on the same. We have about two acres of property here on our base, and we have a, a wonderful children's home at the top of our property where the kids live. And then we mm -hmm. live in a little house. Me and my wife live in like a, a tiny house kind of with our son at the bottom. So you're like the house mom and the house dad sort of thing for these kids. No, we're not, okay. but there are house mom and house dad. We just help serve. We're more of the cool aunts okay. and uncles. <laughs> okay, I see. I see. You know, I adopted all three of my kids. That's right. I knew that, man. Yeah. So I've been to some places like that, you know, cool. in, in other countries where uh, you see exactly how the house moms are and what the situation is like and what have you. So that's very cool that you're uh, you're their uncles and aunts. There. And did you say you have your own as well, child? Yeah, yeah. So we just have a son named Elias. 
He's one year old. Oh, congrats. I didn't know that. Thanks, man. How has the first year been? Good, man. It's been a blessing, dude. You know, you understand a different part of the heart of God, obviously. Yes. You yeah. understand more of the heart of God when you just see, you know, what it means to be a dad and the frailty of creation. And yes. yes. Obviously, the hard side is not sleeping, but yeah. yes, yes, you learn, I, to, you learn to get over that. <laughs> I've got a six, a four, and a seven month right now. Oh so, man! Yeah, the house is busy, <laughs> and uh, yeah, particularly my seven month old has challenged me on just how much sleep I can go on and still function in the day. So <laughs> I know exactly what you're referring to. Um. Just curious on a different note, what's it like being on the border of Texas? You know, we hear all these stories about people crossing over and there being all these people, huge lineups trying to get into America. Do you see that firsthand? So we've been here m more during the pandemic than before the pandemic. Mm. So, I mean, that's definitely changed okay. a lot of things. Um, but I mean, there's lots of immigrants here that are just, you know, got deported from the States and they're here or right. there's a huge Cuban population here in, in Juarez okay. because of that. Um, yeah. I don't, we're, we're learning and growing and knowing the culture now because the okay. pandemic is coming to a place where we can get out more. Right. Um, but because of the pandemic, it was like, Oh man, I feel like I don't know the city that I live in. I don't because of, or the crisis that people live because the pandemic kind of closed us down for a season. Right. Yes, absolutely. And are you fluent in Spanish now? Yeah, man. Yep. Wow, that's very cool. How long did that take? Um, yeah, so that's a that's a story, man. I was fluent after about so the Holy Spirit um, poured out on me in, in the gift of, of speaking Spanish in the sixth week of my discipleship training school. And so I would say I was fluent after about like one hundred percent fluent. I could do a conversation, full conversation without anything. After about three, three or four months of being in Mexico. Wow. And you're saying that is not from your own study, although I'm sure, but most of that's from the, from the pouring yeah, yeah. of the Holy Spirit. Definitely, man. Wow. Yeah. Was there any time where you were literally like this gift of tongues, the gift of speaking in tongues where you were speaking and didn't even know that you were, or did it just. So there's, there's this like moment where we were in a youth prison doing evangelism. And I was just praying and asking God, you know, for these words of encouragement, what we might consider prophetic words to build up the inmates in this youth prison. And as we were sharing the gospel, I just couldn't find a translator. And I just had this burning fire to speak right. over these guys. And it's just like, Holy Spirit, give me Spanish in the name of Jesus. You know, one of those faithful prayers. And you're just like, okay. I just went up and started praying over people. Like 30 minutes later, I'm like, oh, wow. I didn't know any Spanish yesterday. <laughs> Oh you know my I mean? soul, that's yeah, amazing. So yeah, it was it was really beautiful. And yeah, I just thank God because it's been such a door opener when you can yes. understand and speak and and really yeah, minister to the hearts of people in their own language. Wow. So three, four months, and then yeah. you're fluent in Spanish. That's amazing in itself. Yeah. And uh, has your spice tolerance increased at all? Of course, man. I love spicy food. <laughs> <laughs> I always tell Jackie when I when I got here, I thought ketchup was spicy. You know what I mean? It's like yeah. you grow to love. Yeah, you grow to love that kind of stuff. It's good. Yeah, very cool. So you mentioned when we were talking beforehand that Malagash was I don't know if you said it was the driver, but it was a major driver pushing you into the mission field. Yeah, man. Um, tell me more about that, dude. When you see young people that have a real relationship with Jesus, it makes you hungry. Mm -hmm. you know that's what i saw at malagash was there's young people who actually love god here yes you know they might not be perfect they might not be this they might not be that but they have an honest desire and you know it was that that door opening that mind opening thought for me was like wow you know i could actually do this for the rest of my life yeah and it's real and it's changing people's lives i should tell somebody about this right you know what i mean and i saw fruit in the first you know, I went back to my high school as a preacher, man. You know what I mean? It's just that encounter changed me forever. And it was right. it was that that idea of I saw other people doing what I wanted to live. And I'm not I'm not gonna hold back. I'm not gonna yeah, I want it. You know, I remember all those guys that used to go on the Ecuador mission strip. Yeah, man, that sounds amazing. Why don't I do that? You know what I right. mean? 
And it was that place of just saying, God, I believe you can use me. And I want to do something. I want to bring your kingdom to earth. And I remember Keith Marble specifically spoke prophetically over my life, words of encouragement to build me up, saying, Mitch, I believe you're going to do great things and lots of people are going to be changed through your life. And I'll never forget those words. Mm -hmm. They ministered in my heart. And it was just that idea of, God, I believe you can. Why not? You know, I lived in inferiority and insecurity. When I encountered Jesus, it was that starting of that process of overcoming the lies of the enemy in my life. Yes. And just seeing God manifest himself through my hands. I'll never forget another teacher on my discipleship training school spoke. And in my life, he said, Mitch, you know, David would have never known that he was going to kill Goliath. But when he stepped out, when he just said he, he would, God moved in mighty ways. Be willing. And yeah. for me, it was, that, it was that idea of, God, I'm going to live with open hands. Whatever you want to do through me, I'll do it. God will give my life for you. It doesn't matter. And that that's kind of what I feel like has marked my life of just being willing to be yeah. a friend of God and to be trustworthy with his secrets. I was secrets. I like that. Amen. Yeah. Uh, and your wife is Mexican? Yes, man. Yep. So you met her on the mission field? Yes. Yep. So you want to share that story quickly? How'd you guys oh. meet? And Oh, man. Yeah. So I was her discipleship training school leader. <laughs> we fell in of love. Of course you were. <laughs> a little love in India. It's like every YWAM, every YWAM story. <laughs> right. and you so, said you fell in love in India? Yeah, man. We were on, okay. I never talked to her in, in her lecture phase. It's just one of those things where there was a girl who co led the DTS with me. I was like, you take the girls, I've got enough problems with the guys. You know, so yeah. I, like, I don't need to talk with these guys. And so, you know, just started to get to know her, saw her character, saw her genuine love for God. You know, it was one of those things where it's like, hey, I want to get married yeah and i think this girl's the right girl and so let's do it you know what i mean and she was super like yeah come on okay. it was definitely a story of god moving and that could be another podcast in itself but okay yeah i mean just and beautiful do you think in 10 years from now you'll still be in mexico i, I wouldn't say in mexico i don't okay. know we've got some things on the back burner that we feel like god's been speaking to us for the future um but definitely on the mission field right this Very is a call cool. for life. Yep. Very it's, cool. It's, and I want to define that because people can can think, you know, ah, oh, missionaries and can idolize even this this calling. We really believe that missions is a mentality. Mm -hmm. We live on mission as Christians when we decide we become missionaries when we decide to live on mission. That's the truth. You can be a missionary yes. in your workplace. You can bring the kingdom of God in your doctor's office, in your dentist's office, whatever you are. You can bring the kingdom of God. We serve. The sphere of the church in this way, um, living as what some might consider full-time missionaries or transcultural missionaries or missionaries to the sphere of the church. So definitely want to clarify that we've decided to live on mission in this expression of what that can look like. Right, right. Very cool. Very, very cool. All right. So I'm going to transition just a little bit into a little bit more lighter subjects. For those people that don't know you. And uh, some of these may, there may not be an answer. You just go next. That's fine too. So do you remember, what is the funniest place you've ever fallen asleep? Oh man, the funniest place I've ever fallen asleep. Or the most odd place. Oh. Man, the most odd place I've ever fallen asleep. I just, what comes to my mind is one time we, we, walked down in the into the jungle seven hours down a mountain i was so tired man is this is in mexico I to, yeah i went to sleep at like 6 p.m i think <laughs> yeah. on, the, on the church floor and i wake up and there's this huge spider on the bench next to me and i'm just like okay i'm just gonna go back to sleep <laughs> <laughs> yeah. god protect me uh, yeah. <laughs> let's go to sleep okay do you know if you were born a girl do you know what your parents would have named you Michelle, I think. Okay. I would have been a Jennifer. Well, but Michelle, go. I guess, is Mitch, Michelle. I guess that's very similar. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Now, I consider you a person of intelligence and looks. Don't get me wrong. But uh, would you ever trade intelligence for looks or looks for intelligence? Oh, man. I think you can look pretty intelligent and you can be good looking if you're intelligent. Okay. But, <laughs> depends. Um, no, I wouldn't trade. I think I might trade looks for intelligence. I, I, 
I would like to be smarter than I am. Okay, fair enough, fair enough. And if I said, Mitch, there's been this terrible cataclysmic event, you can only eat one food for the rest of your life, what do you think you choose? Curry. Curry? Yep. Is there curry? Is there a lot of curry in Mexico? Nope, but when I ate it in India, I was like, I would never, ever get tired of this for the rest of my life. <laughs> like curry and rice. Yes, man. It's, it's like you can eat it at breakfast, lunch, dinner, and every time it tastes good. <laughs> okay, fair enough, fair enough. Um, here's a question for you, maybe a little bit deeper. Have you had a favorite age of your life so far, or is each year getting better? Each year is very different. Getting better? Let's say, let's say I'm getting better too. Yeah. Um, but if, if I could say, wow, you know, a year that marked my life, 21 when I got married was a big year for me. Right. Um, brought a lot of change. Yeah. But I mean, a favorite age? I'll, no, I don't think so. Man, I've, I've really enjoyed every year and I feel like I'm growing closer to Jesus and becoming more like him every year. Good. Good. <laughs> Uh, and what meal is your favorite, breakfast, lunch, or supper? Man, that's changing. Like, yeah. I don't know. I would, I would, if you would ask me this six months ago, I would have for sure said breakfast. Okay. But I think right now it's lunch. <laughs> okay. And in six months from now, it'll be supper. Who knows, man? It might be midnight snack if you ask me in a year. <laughs> yeah. Where do you, what source do you get your news from? What source do I get my news from? Uh... I read the Google News, so like I have yeah. a bunch of stuff that I follow. Facebook, something. Yeah. Uh, Honestly, I get a lot from Facebook too. I don't yeah. know if that's the best source, but yeah. I do. I, I try to follow people who are on kind of both sides of the thing. So, yeah, yeah, yeah I, I, I do read the Google Google News pretty frequently. Um, I know the life of a missionary. Maybe I'm wrong, but. Uh, uh, Maybe you have loads of money and you're not telling me. I'm not sure. But uh, if you had a bunch of money, would you rather spend it on experiences or on material things? Experiences. Uh, travel the world. Yeah, yeah, travel the world. Nice. I'd sit down in a slum somewhere and buy food for the guy that's sitting in front of me and just want to listen to him. See what he has to say. Okay. Very cool. Yeah, yeah. See what life Very could do. Cool. That's a beautiful heart. Uh, do you have any phobias? Phobias, 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 phobias. I'm not super good with heights. I'm not okay. gonna lie. Yeah. When I when I stand up on a ladder, I'm like, okay, I don't really like this. If you know, if there's another guy there, and you're all hold the ladder, man. You you get up there, you know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah. fair enough. Fair enough. Okay, I'm gonna move on to a little bit more serious questions here. Um, have you ever had a dream? or vision from God that you knew with what a hundred percent this was from God. And if yep. it's yes, do you mind me uh, asking what that dream or vision was? I'm just thinking about what I could share. Um, like which one to share more than, more than anything. Okay. I'm not saying that I've had a, I'm not a super big dreamer, but when mm -hmm. I have, when sometimes when I have dreams, it's like, Oh yeah, I know it's from God. I'm just remembering one from my, my first time in Mexico was like, I remember I really wanted to do the Bethel School of Supernatural Ministry after I finished my discipleship training school. I was like, I want to grow in seeing more of God and, you know, that passion, that fire can often be for the things of God. You want to see miracles. You want to see him move. I just remember God coming to me in a dream. This is what I felt like. And he said, Mitch, what are you doing after your DTS? I said, God, I'm going to go to the Bethel School of Supernatural Ministry. And he said, Mitch, you are a Bethel. Right. I was like, Okay. And Bethel literally means house of God. Yes. And I felt like that was God leading me yes. not to do that program, not speaking poorly against that program at all. It just wasn't for me in that season. And that's when God started to reveal his will for me to serve in this country and the way that I'm doing today. What do you think, uh, and this wasn't on my paper to ask you, what do you think the balance is between uh, living our lives on the principles that we know are godly Christian principles that we get from the Bible day by day versus asking God for the nitty gritty little, should I, should I put this sock on or this sock on? Or where do you think the balance is between that? That's, that's a very good question. And I think that we fall into extremes and the enemy always works in extremes. 
Yes. And I think that's we can see that is part of his character. It's only what we learn from the Bible, or it's only what the Holy Spirit says. And sometimes we use the Bible to prove that that's what we think he's saying. Yeah. And so I think that when we grow in true intimacy with God, there comes a time where the general, we put the general things of the word of God. I'm going to talk about three callings that we have in, in life. We have a high calling, a general calling, and a specific calling. Our high okay. calling that comes from the book of Mark, chapter three, if I'm not mistaken. <laughs> it's, you know, God calls us to be with him. Mm -hmm. You know, that's our first calling in life. We are called to be intimate children him. of Jesus. You know, he calls us to be with him. Then he calls us to practice the things that are written in the Bible. You know, there's, there's, we take them as suggestions, but they're things that we're actually called to put into practice, you know, wisdom, um, giving, um, I don't know, loving, making disciples. Those are all things that are just general that you can live out wherever you are, whatever you do. Right. The general call of God. Yes. The general call of God. And then there's a specific part that comes from that place of understanding your high calling, your general calling, and then your specific calling at, you know, as you serve, where do you find yourself as most useful? Where do you find that God uses you the most and allow him to speak into those areas, you know? And so it's Amen. that it's specific, you know, I would say my specific calling might be for the area of discipleship, might be for the area of apostolic ministries, doing new things in new ways. Um, that's part of my specific calling. But I don't get to say, ah, oh, I'm going to disciple people, but not give. Or I'm going to disciple people, but I'm not going to love. Or I'm going to disciple people, but I'm going to be foolish. No, I don't get to do those things, you know. So it's, mm -hmm. it's as we read the Bible. And as we, as we seek God, we believe that he speaks. And the Bible is the principal truth upon which everything is founded. But mm -hmm. we actually find, you know, many different ways that God speaks throughout history in his word. That's he right. He speaks through creation. He speaks through prophets. He speaks through um, visions, dreams, supernatural encounters. We see that throughout history. So why, why would God change his way of being? We open up our mind to those things. We open up our understanding to allow God to speak in those ways. And we compare it against us where we test the spirits. Mm -hmm. Amen. And we do it in godly eldership, allowing others that we believe are godly to speak into those things. You know, I've thought that's right. many times, you know, emotions can take control of those things. And that's yes. why a lot of a lot of the things that people say are God have a bad rap because they're not walked out in a godly manner. You mentioned that you're, you're right when you say that, you know, um, First Corinthians 14, 3 says, one who prophesies speaks to men for edification, exhortation, and comfort. Mm. And I think personally that the role of a prophet changed a little bit after the Holy Spirit came. Because prior to the Holy Spirit coming, uh, you sought out a prophet for the word of God. You know, the David had Nathan, David had Samuel. What is, what is the word of God? Then when the Holy Spirit came, we now have, as you are high calling, one with God, one with Christ, one with the Holy Spirit. We have a direct relationship with Christ. So it's interesting because I believe a prophet, our prophecy today is almost always a confirmation of what, what God has already revealed to us. For example, you know, you've got uh, Paul who um, is about to go to Jerusalem. And Agabus, the prophet, takes Paul's belt and wraps his hands and legs with it and says, if you go to Jerusalem, this is what's going to happen. And Paul says, stop weeping and breaking my heart. God has already shown me what I must suffer for his sake. So uh, I don't know if, that, if that's the same line of thinking of your thinking. But when you talk about having those elders that speak into your life, you know, I think I'm hearing this. Uh, can you confirm this is the word? Do you know what I mean? So oftentimes it's a confirmation of what God has already uh, stated. Would, would you agree? Yeah. And how, how can I walk that out? I think for me is one of the, when you have someone who doesn't get excited, you know, about what you're thinking, who doesn't necessarily yes. think, oh, wow, that's the, ne that's the next sliced bread. You know what I mean? Or yeah. wow, you know, it's that being able to sit on it and say, okay, but Mitch, have you thought about this? Mitch, but what are the right. implications of this? You know, that for me is something beautiful. And when you can sit down in prayer together with those people, then that's where you can hear the fullness in wisdom. 
You know, the yeah. Bible says in the multitude of counselors is where we find wisdom. That's right. People who walk alone and say that God spoke to them, you know, you got to stand back for a second because th that's where there is the ability to, that the word of God can be twisted. Yes. And it might, might have been a word of God, but it might not be walked out in a godly way. Yes. yes. And the character of God is more important than the word of God. In the, in, when we talk about walking something out, we need to walk it out in love. We need to walk it out in humility and meekness. You know, those are the things that have to accompany the word of God when we bring it, when we walk it out. That's right. Yes, yeah. absolutely. There's always God may give someone a word of knowledge or something. Um, and that doesn't mean that knowledge is for the whole world. Like, listen, I think uh, God told me that you're cheating on your wife. You know, well, that's not something you then go broadcast to the world, right? Even though, God, he's, he, you know, that's a personal thing or, or whatever it may be. You know? So I know exactly what you mean. Interesting. Very interesting. I like that. I've never heard the high call of God, the general call of God, and then the specific call of God. I think that's very, uh, very intriguing. I'm going to chew on that. I like that, though. Mark 3, 13 and 14, if I'm not mistaken. Okay. Um, a little bit more deeper, as I mentioned. So, um, well, let me ask you this, not on my paper. Is the Canadian church different from the Mexican church? It, it should be, and it is. There's a different cultural expression. The redemption of culture in every expression of the local body. You know, you'll see it in different parts of of Canada, you'll see different expressions in the Maritimes than you might see in Vancouver. Yeah. You'll see different expressions within ethnic groups here, you know, and not in necessarily Mexico City has a different expression than what, you know, a little town in the jungle has, you know what I mean? So there definitely is definitely, there's definitely a difference everywhere you go. Not in just Some cultural expression though, but do you think in their hunger for God or their passion for God or, and I don't know, maybe I'm being very general here, but definitely. My, my bias is that, you know, maybe Canadians are a little bit more well off than Mexicans are. So maybe we rely on material things more than the Mexican church does. Am I off base there? Or do you see things like that? Every church has its weaknesses and has its strengths. The Canadian church is something beautiful in the body, the same way that the Mexican church does. Each church right. has its strengths. Each church has its weaknesses. I don't think we can. I've heard many people say that, you know, the Latino church has this great hunger for God. Okay, that might be fair in a passionate and emotional way. But right. I see that Canadian pastors might read the Bible a little bit more than a Mexican pastor would commonly do. So right. what, what's hunger? How do you define hunger? Right, right. I like what you said that reminded me. I, I almost gave you an option, and, and it was probably my bad for stating it that way, where you could have spoken poorly of one church or the other, and you didn't. You just said, you know, the Canadian church is beautiful. The Mexican church is beautiful. And, and you talked about, you know, you grew up in a Catholic church. I remember I was speaking with one of my Catholic friends once. Mm -hmm. And I said, the church is blah, blah, blah. And I said something that was probably true, but uh, was degrading in a way. Mm -hmm. And he looked at me and he said, the church is the bride of Christ. How dare you speak about the church like that? <laughs> I know, and I was like, hi, yeah, yeah. And then I thought about it, I was like, he's absolutely right. And I, you just reminded me of that then. You know, whether it's the Canadian church, the African church, the Chinese church, the American church, the Mexican church, the Brazil church, this is the bride of Christ. Amen. You know, so how dare we talk about any one of those expressions of the church or culture in a, in a negative light? So uh, thank you for reminding me of that. No worries, man. Um, Here's a little bit of a hot button topic for you. Should Christians participate in yoga? Uh oh. <laughs> Depends on who you ask. <laughs> <laughs> I know, I know. I'm asking you. <laughs> um, emptying of the mind, I would say, is non biblical. I would say we're called to fill our minds with the word of God. Yes. But I also think that stretching is very effective for the body. Yes. So, do I participate in stretching while filling my mind with the word of God? Oftentimes, yes. Okay, fair enough. <laughs> okay, fair enough. Um, why is there so much suffering and poverty in the world? I don't want to give a cheap answer. Because a lot of people suffer. 
And it's not fair to give a cheap answer to a question like that. Mm -hmm. And I think what I see is the bride of Christ, the ambassadors of the kingdom of God, who haven't lived out in the way that they could and should his kingdom. They haven't loved on the poor. They haven't loved on the suffering. Um, that is part of the answer, I believe, why there is so much poverty and suffering in the world is the, okay. the children of God have not lived out their calling and the potential that we could have to create you know, godly wealth, business that edifies struggling areas. I believe that's part of it. Greed is obviously part of the, a yeah. part of the answer. I'll interrupt you just for a second because you remind me of something. Do you know if just every church in North America every church adopted one child there'd be that. no orphans in north america i didn't know just that. one per church so when you say we're not living of the call of god that touches home too right because we're not yeah you know i yeah i can't i can't speak yet but i mean for me part i have to be part of the answer to the orphan crisis for me right Right. You're living with them, you see the beauty and the brokenness at the same time. And I think yeah. that's where institutionalizing the answer is the wrong answer. But oftentimes it's the only answer that's left because of the, mis the misunderstanding that the body of Christ has about adoption. Yeah. 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 So I interrupted. Uh, you were saying there's greed in terms of so much suffering. Mm. Yeah, and then there's you know, there's emotional problems, obviously. And I I worked with people who lived in homelessness for for years, and it wasn't because they couldn't get a job. It was I can't hold a job because of my emotional state of being. Yeah, and it's not just a physical answer, but it actually has to be a void that's been filled because of abuse, because of human trafficking, mm -hmm. because of AIDS. Because of all of these different things that aren't necessarily an easy answer. Mm -hmm. And people say, what if we provide a homeless shelter? What if we provide? That's not necessarily 100% the only answer to all of these questions. And so, you know, greed, I think, is a big one. Well, you know, a certain part of the population holds so much wealth of the world's wealth that could answer many questions and develop many programs that would help the world to grow. In, in their understanding of how to distribute wealth. And so suffering, you know, is God there? Is God not there? Of course, God is there. Does he always heal? No. Am I 100% convinced? Why? Not always. Mm -hmm. You know, I've seen people be healed. I've seen the blind open their eyes through prayer. I've seen people get out of wheelchairs through prayer. I've seen all of that, but I've also watched people die. I've also hugged someone with AIDS, you know, and watched them on their deathbed. You know, mm -hmm. and so it's that understanding of God's goodness and his character and understanding that the best thing that could ever happen to us is not that our physical body would live, but that our yes. spirit would live in eternity with him. Amen. And reconciling ourselves unto him is always the answer. Yes. And so for me, I think when I think of suffering, when I think of poverty, I don't always have the answer to every question. What I do know is that when we find intimacy with God, there will come a fullness in the heart that we can only find in him. Amen. Amen. And I hope that's not a cheap answer for anyone. It's who's not a cheap answer. It's hard. And God permits it. And some people, some ways we find that hard too. But then again, God permits humans to make choices, you know. So uh, I like that answer. And, and final, final deeper question. Um, Christ has changed your life. Mm -hmm. What makes Christ or Christianity different from other world faiths or other religions in your mind? Friendship with God. I can know my creator and he wants to make himself known. Right. And I think that for me is what makes it different. There comes a fullness of my life, not only out of obedience to a set of rules, but out of a Holy Spirit who lives every day with me. And a Jesus who has reconciled my life unto the Father. And I can find not only eternal security as in something that's going to happen, but as mm -hmm. in something that is happening. Yes. And so, yes. you know, we talk about salvation and we often think of heaven. 
we have to remember that the word in Greek for salvation is sozo. Sozo has many different meanings. Yes. It's redemption. It's healing. It's reconciliation. It's restoration. You know, when we talk about salvation, we talk about something that's very big. We talk about something that's greater than just a golden ticket to heaven. We talk about God working in our lives today. And that's, for me, the forgiveness of sins is one aspect of salvation. But I am growing in my salvation today. I'm working out my salvation with fear and trembling. Mm -hmm because of the greater understanding that I have of salvation, as in I'm being redeemed, I'm being yes. restored, I'm being healed, and I'm becoming like the God who called me. Right. Amen. Amen. Okay. Um, going back to a little bit lesser, um, not as, as, as more fun questions here, getting back to Malagash for a second, before we close for the evening. Um, now I know you were you were volunteered for a little bit. You were on a uh, cabin lead or a uh, camper for a little bit, and then you had a full summer there. Do you have any great memories of pranks or any great stories that you like to share about Malagash? The one summer when I was on full time staff, I was thinking like, was I even really part of this? And what um, we did was we borrowed a guy's goat from Malagash and we <laughs> let it loose in the girls' loft. I didn't wake up and they woke me up with the goat and the goat was like <laughs> pooping all around my stuff and eating my hair. And I was like, what? Oh, <laughs> oh, <gee. laughs> so, first the goat or the spider? Yeah, I know, man. The goat, the goat might be worse, honestly. <laughs> yeah. And Chewing so, yeah. Hair. Jeepers. So it went, it got in it's the girl's loft and then somehow got over to the boy's loft. Yeah. And the girl's loft was covered in goat poop. <laughs> goats when they get nervous they poop i didn't know that oh that's funny hey. so um i'm about to close but before we close is there anything you want to say or anything pressing on your heart that you feel like we haven't discussed yet or any questions for me yeah any what i was just thinking was um just really believing that there's a greater wave of missionaries to come out of malagash okay yeah just i just want to Speak, that. Really speak to that and say whoever has a missional calling and is watching us tonight and is called for full-time ministry or in a sphere of influence if you feel like you're called to create a godly business if you feel like you're called to um, create a program to develop anti-human trafficking uh, networks in in east india or wherever you might be and whatever god is calling you to be i just want to say yes and amen to the things that god has put in your heart and whatever that might be, I really believe that Malagash has a greater wave of missionaries to come out of Amen. their programs for Amen. the nations. So that girl or that yeah, that young adult, female, young adult, male that's hearing that, that thinks God has a calling on their life. And they're like, yes, I think that's me. What's the next step for them? Um, talk with a spiritual elder in your life. Find a find a place that's doing what you think you're called to do okay. find mentors you know seek me out if you're hearing this and you want to send me a message you know come wherever yep. you know get encouraged what's the easiest way to connect with you if someone wants to reach out to you just search me up on facebook mitch foreign that's an easy way instagram mitch foreign um yeah email's old old now i don't know if anyone well we still use email but search me up on instagram search me up on facebook okay. i'll be gladly be your friend and answer any questions that you have Okay. Um, find a training program that might help you to grow in your intimacy with God in your understanding of your general calling. Yes. And if any of our audience wants to support you personally, how do they do that? Whether financially or prayer or what have you? Yeah, we'd love to get in contact with you, whether it be through email. My email is mitchellforin at gmail.com. And Facebook as well is a great way to contact me. And um, yeah, we'd love to have more people praying for us. We're always looking to grow our support team in prayer and in finances for the things that God has called us to do together. Mm -hmm. And is that all under the umbrella of YWAM or is it a different missionary organization now? Or No, nope, I'm all under the umbrella of Youth of the Mission. Yep. Okay, got it. Very cool. Yep. Very so cool. I've been working with them for the past eight years. Very cool. Very cool. Well, thank you very much. Thank you for joining us. I believe anyone who listens to this will be blessed and uh, really appreciate your service to Malagash and now your service to mexico into the world yeah andy thank you for your service to malagash thank you for doing this it's good to get the word out about what malagash is doing i received jesus at malagash i received a call to missions at malagash 
I am super thankful for all of the people who invested their time and life in the man who I am today. And I have so many people that I could thank. Keith, uh, Keith uh, Marble, Matt Buston, Pelham, Forsyth, um, Ali Davidson, all of these people, you know, um, Morgan, oh, so many, just, you know, the list is so long. Brandon Fillmore, Scott Holman, Carmen Swain, Ben Swain, all of those people who walked with me in those beginning years, just so, so thankful to each one of them for the, the things that they gave me and the, the model that they showed me of who Jesus is and who I could become in him. So thank Amen. you to everyone who invested in my life and for the ministry of Malagash Bible Camp. Amen. Amen. 